All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, control of real world things, and in particular, a proportional integral and differential controller. And some of you may have seen this in your engineering class, but today we'll, we'll build one of these. And the basic idea is that you want to control something in the real world, like for example, the level of this drone. And there's an accelerometer inside of here that measures how far this drone has tilted away from, from perfectly level. And the very first way we'll use to control this is called proportional control, where if you're tilted a little bit away from level and the goal is to level the drone, then the error term is the difference between where you are, which is a little bit tilted, and where you want to be, which is straight. And so the controller will calculate the error between where you are and where you want to be. It will multiply it by some constant of proportionality, and it will drive the motors proportional to that error. So if you're tilted a little bit this way, it'll speed up the motors over here. And if you're tilted and slow down the motors over here, proportionally to that error, if you're tilted a little bit this way, it will do the opposite. Now, if I had a battery in here, you could actually see, it's a little bit dangerous, which I haven't done it, but if I tilt this back and forth, you can hear and feel the, the propellers on either side revving up, trying to balance the drone. So that's one sort of very physical example of a PID controller. Um, Oh, so that, that, I've just described the P. I'll describe the I and the D in a little bit. Um, another example that you should have in mind as I describe these things is, is this. And camera person, you can tell me what the, what, what the top of this box says. Thor Labs temperature controller. Temperature controller. And most importantly, so this is going to control the temperature of something that you plug into it. And what do these little knobs here say under them? P-I-D. P-I-N-D. Yeah, so they're little knobs that allow you to adjust the constant of proportionality of a, uh, a P, I, and a D. So, so what I described the P, where the farther off from where you want to be, the higher you uh, rev the motors. What, what is the point of the I and the D? Well, the I really comes when you have some friction, and that'll be the case today where we are controlling this device. So what this is, is it is a, a motor here with two wires. I've soldered a red and a black wire to the motor. That's just a regular DC motor. You put in voltage one way and it will spin the motor one way. And you put in voltage the other way, it will spin the motor the other way. And that motor is attached through a belt drive to a slide potentiometer. And so as usual, the potentiometer has three wires coming off of it. The ends of the wires, the ends of the wires are yellow and green, and the middle ends of the potentiometer, in the middle of the potentiometer is white. And so you can set this potentiometer up to measure the voltage at the center of the potentiometer, and that's basically gonna tell you right away what the position of this thing is. So what is this thing used for? Well, if, you're, if you go to a fancy concert or a big auditorium or something, there's often a sound board in the back and someone's controlling the soundboard. And the, in the old days, the soundboard would just have an array of potentiometers that someone could adjust for each of the channels and each of the frequencies. Um, modern soundboards have, have these, which are potentiometers, but uh, you can turn it into some mode where the little motor motors a potentiometer into certain locations. So that's what this, this thing is really used for. It's some audio soundboard component. But we're gonna just use it as a thing that we can control. So, <clears throat> The signal you will send is just the voltage on the motor through the red and black wires, and the position, which you will read out from the potentiometer, is the voltage on the white wire, on the center, the center of that position. And so you will, uh, you will have another potentiometer, a separate potentiometer, that you will adjust, and it can either be a slide potentiometer or a knob potentiometer, and the error signal will be the difference between the one you can adjust and this one. So if you, if you want the motor to go right to the center, you would adjust your slider to the center, and hopefully this one should, um, should move the, the motor right to the center and then stop. And if you want it to go over here, you'll move your slider over here, and hopefully this one will go over there. And you'll be able to feel, if you set the potentiometer, the, the goal position to be over here, you can feel with your fingers, as you pull off of that, it'll want to push, push back. Um, and the very first term of these, the P term, is 
you'll, you'll be able to feel it pretty clearly. As you, as you pull away from the center, you'll feel a force, which is caused by the voltage on the motor. You'll feel a force that's proportional to how far off you've, you've pushed. OK, so what is the I and the D term? Well, the I term comes because there's a little bit of friction here. In particular, there's some static friction. So say I, I command the motor to go here with my other potentiometer, and it moves. And as it's moving, um, it, if, I, if my constant of proportionality isn't very big, as it's moving, it'll slow down because the, the error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm putting less and less voltage onto the motor. It'll slow down. And if it stops before it gets to where we want it to go, there's just a tiny little error left over. Um, and that's not enough to get the motor moving again. And so the I term integrates that error very slowly over time. And that the interval of the error builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. And eventually, there's enough voltage on the motor to <clears throat> nudge it over a little bit. And so the integral here is meant to kind of correct final, final DC offsets. So if I command it to go here, I want it to go here, not a little, not almost here. That's what the integral term does. And you will calculate the error, and they'll amplify it with some constant proportionality. You'll calculate the integral and amplify it with some constant proportionality. What's the derivative term for? Well, the derivative term comes when you want to really optimize performance. So um, imagine you want the motor to go, go here uh, as quickly as possible. Well, one thing you can do is you could crank up this proportional gain to be pretty high. But what will happen is this motor will spin up. And even though when, when the slider is where you want it to be, the error is 0, it still has some inertia. And it will overshoot. And then the error will be in the opposite direction. And a huge constant of proportionality will, will pull the thing back. And what you'll see is if we crank up the, the P gain too much, it will oscillate around where you want it to be. And so you have to dial down the proportional gain until it stops oscillating. But then it might, it might not be quite as snappy as you'd like. And so what the D term does is it allows you to crank up the proportional gain um, and then add a little bit of derivative such that as, as, this thing is approaching, um, as this thing is approaching its goal, the error is 0, but the derivative of the error is not 0. And so we'll add a little bit of derivative with a sign such that it actually slows down as it's approaching. So it allows you to crank up the P gain a little bit, um, but keep it from oscillating because you add a little bit of D in the opposite direction. So there's, you know, as it's approaching its, its uh, zero point, its set point, um, and, and the error term is going to zero, the, a little bit of derivative term is going to kind of nudge you back. Now what we'll find when we actually build this is that almost all of the control for this particular motor and these particular component choices is in the proportional setting. So we'll be able to tune the proportional controller to give us a pretty good response. And we'll see that there's a little bit of leftover offset if we, if we kind of go slow, which we'll fix with a little bit of integral. And the D term is a little bit harder to see, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll play with it a little bit. So let me actually show you the circuit that we'll build in, in real time. I have a version of it over here. Let's turn around. and So what I have here is I have a version of what we'll build today. My input slider I can control manually by sliding this up and down. And my output motor should match where the slider is. So I slide the slider up, it goes that way. I slide the slider down, it goes that way. And at every point, it's matching where, where I uh, want to be. So what am I looking at? Well, on channel 1, the yellow channel, I'm looking at my input slider. And channel 4, the last channel, I'm looking at the result on, this, on the resulting potentiometer. And so the fact that this is doing its job means that green is really following yellow quite well. So what uh, I'm looking at a couple other channels too. Purple, which I didn't have before. This is the error. So in purple, I'm looking at the error. So as I go up, there's a little bit of error, but that error ends up going away. As I go down, there's a little bit of error. That error goes away. Uh, blue is the uh, voltage that I'm actually sending to the motor. So that's right now it's almost all P. So blue and blue and purple are basically on top of each other. Um, and you can see that 
as I move up, I send some voltage, and then it calms down, I send some voltage, and then it calms down, I send some voltage, it calms, calms down. So this is one way of doing it, is by hand, having it match, uh, match the potentiometer here. And you'll see that this is actually quite hard. The first thing that you will build is you'll have this potentiometer not in some complicated feedback system like I've described, but you'll have the potentiometer directly controlling the voltage on the motor. And you'll see that that's kind of hard to, hard to do anything because you have to turn the voltage of the motor up, turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, and eventually this thing's gonna jump over as it overcomes that static friction. And it's gonna zoom probably all the way to one end. And you'll, you can try to get good at turning, the, turning this knob up and down a little bit to control the, the current through the motor. Um, but that's, that's not very easy to control the current and have it go somewhere in particular. So play, playing with that a little bit for the people who will build that circuit uh, gives you a sense for you know, the impressive feat that the actual feedback loop is doing um, because it is, it is controlling the current of the motor in just the right way to get you where you need to go. And then the next step is to override the, the potentiometer, the input potentiometer, with a, uh, with a function generator. So let me do that. Uh, I'm just going to clip this output of the function generator right on to the output of the potentiometer. And now I will force it to be a particular voltage, and I can turn, turn that up. So now I'm forcing it to be a sine wave. And you see that yellow and green are now sine waves. And the blue and the purple, which is right behind it, that is the voltage that's going to the motor. And so as I want to move the motor in one direction or the other, I, I have to apply the right voltages at the right times, and it is automatically calculating roughly what that should be. And I can send in a triangle wave and have it go pretty linear, linearly back and forth. Let me turn that up a little bit. Um, or I can send in a square wave, and now it'll bounce between two extremes. Now let me turn this roll off. Let me just actually trigger it properly. So as you can see that over and over again, the yellow, you can't really see the vertical shoot up of the yellow, but the yellow is extremely sharp because it's the square wave. The green, which is the measured position, take some time to, to reach the, the final result, but it, it ends up doing it. It ends up, um, it ends up uh, reaching the, the yellow. And the actual voltage that has to, to go in um, ends up being high at first to get it to, to move over, but then it actually turns a little bit negative to slow it down and stop it. And uh, let me, I can, I can change the amplitude here. Make it go a little bit further back and forth or a little bit less back and forth and between two, two shorter uh, distances. Um, and I can make it go faster, so let me do that. So there it's going faster, 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 faster. I'm still putting in a square wave. Let me zoom in on the oscilloscope a little bit. So there's sort of eventually some limit here, so I'm still, I'm still reaching the maximum um, about, you know, it's still pausing for a while before I Make it go the other way, but if I can keep going faster and faster and faster, eventually it, it can't really keep up. And here, here I am reaching the right, the right maximum and minimum, but not, not fast enough. So here I'm going faster and faster and faster. And the yellow looks still pretty square, but the output is basically pegged as, as, high, as, as high as it can go or as low as it can go. And the green, which is where it actually is, is, is lagging behind. It sort of looks more sine wavy just because of the inertia of this thing is, is smoothing everything out. So this is kind of an extreme use for this. So let me slow it back down and, and get back to the uh, sort of traditional step response, which is what we'll, we'll mostly focus on. Now let me change some of, the, some of the parameters. So I am pretty sure that this changes the proportional gain, although I really should have looked into that before I said something. Maybe I'll edit this out. Okay, op amp number three is the overall, uh, okay, op amp number three. Okay, so the way this works is uh, there, there aren't really separate knobs for P, I, and D. There's one knob to control the overall gain of everything, and there are separate knobs for the amount of integral and the amount of derivative that go in. So I can change the overall gain by turning this last knob, and if I make that gain go, uh, go higher or lower, very little seems to actually happen. Let me go the other way. Ah, okay, so here it's too low, and you can see it doesn't really go very far. It's kind of lackluster. It doesn't really get to where it needs to go. As I turn this up, it's getting to where it needs to go, but 
um, not particularly fast. So if I turn it up a lot, um, I get some, some oscillations in the, in the commanded position, but the actual new position looks pretty good. Let me turn that down to be slightly more reasonable, and let me show you what some of the other, uh, the other parameters do here. So if I turn this one up, uh, not much happens. Oh, there we go. So I'm pretty sure this is the, the integral. <laughs> and if I overdo the integral, um, it integrates the error to be some huge value, and it bounces around quite a bit. Uh, Maybe, uh, would it be clear if you lowered the frequency of the square wave? So we can see the bouncing a little. Yeah, let me lower the frequency of the square wave. So. Well, it just looks like it's overshooting. Yeah. yeah. So let me fix that. And this one, I believe, is the derivative. So right now the derivative is kind of low. And it's overshooting. So the green is, uh, the green is overshooting a little bit. And I will increase the amount of the derivative to have it break a little bit faster. And if I do too much derivative, I get these crazy oscillations, which I definitely don't want. That's really going to heat up the motor and cause all kinds of trouble. So the amount of derivative is just right to, to, to stop that overshoot, but not, not do any uh, serious oscillations. So somewhere around there. Oops, too much. Somewhere around there. Yeah, still a little overshoot. So you'll, you'll play with this yourselves. Um, Turn some of these knobs. So play with this yourselves once once you build it, and different teams will build different parts of this, and we'll connect them together at the end. Okay, so let me let me say a few words about debugging, which uh, came up in the, the first class. So this, the circuit is extremely complicated altogether, but it's very modular, and will divide into teams and build different pieces of the circuit. But even within the circuits you build, you should build it piece by piece by piece. So for example, many of you will have a, a slide potentiometer at the beginning connected to a bunch of stuff. Build that first. Make sure it outputs a voltage in a reasonable range, by between minus 5 and 5, or minus 6 and, and plus 6. You can test that independent of everything else. Then build the next stage with the op amp, then build the next stage, then build the next stage. Um, and, and you can go all the way stage by stage by stage, testing at each stage what, what, uh, what it should do. So for example, we talked briefly about the op-amp circuit that does the differencing. That's what you did your, your uh, exercise on. Um, you should be able to test that little differencing component independently of everything else and then add on to it. So the wrong strategy would be to just build everything all at once, turn it on, see that the current is shooting up and something's getting hot, the power supply's bad, turn it off, and then you have no idea where to start the bike. You want to go piece by piece by piece. Let me just say that again. One of the biggest things you have to deal with are these power transistors to drive the motor. And there are two different kinds of power transistors, and you could very carefully read the label on them, or you could use a component tester. And when you use a component tester, and you put it in and you hit the button, testing, the PNP transistor, it says PNP, and the... Um, the pins are, are printed out. So pin one, the first pin is the base, pin two is the collector, pin three is the emitter. You can tell it's the emitter because there's an arrow. For a PNP transistor, the arrow points in instead of pointing out, like the NPN transistor. So let me just talk about that for a minute uh, on the board. So if you put these two different power transistors in your component tester, you, you'll get these two different pictures. Pin one is always the base for both of them. Pin two is always the collector with no arrow. Pin three is always the emitter with an arrow that goes out, like your the NPN transistors that you know and love, or an arrow that goes in, like the, the PNP transistors, which you haven't used very much of. In the actual circuit, they're hooked up like this. So the bases are hooked to each other. So these are both pin one. 
but uh, and the, the top one is the end-to-end -end transistor you know and love. So this is this is two the collector, and this is three the emitter. Um, one is the base, base. Um, for this one, it's upside down compared to the picture that is uh, on the component tester. So the arrow is always the emitter. So the emitter is here. So pin three is the emitter, and the one without the arrow is always the collector. Pin two is the collector. So pins one, one, the pin ones are connected to each other. The pin threes are connected to each other, and the pin twos go up toward the positive supply or down toward the negative supply. And I would say that this was one of the more common sources of, of error for people who were using these power transistors to drive the motors, just to connect these wrong. But use your component tester, and remember that the emitter is the arrow, whether it's pointing out or in, and uh, that in this circuit, the emitters should be connected to each other, and the bases should be connected to each other. All right, so one of the three groups will build the motor controller. Uh, another of the three groups will build what's called a pseudo op amp. It's basically the differencing circuit and some gain stages that becomes the P in the PID. And the third of the groups will build the integrator and differentiator circuit, and we'll integrate everything together at the end. You will not use 411 op amps today. You will use 358 op amps. And the thing about 358 op amps in the book, um, there's a picture of it on, um, on page 424 here. The 358 op amps are actually chips with two op amps built in. And they have some advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, if there's two op amps built in, that's good because you need half the number of chips. Um, the, the really big advantage of the 358 chips is that the inputs and outputs can go all the way from plus 15 to minus 15. They're called rail-to-rail -rail op amps. So with the 411s, you had to be careful about the input, not to let it get too close to either edge, and the output could not go all the way up. There was always a little gap at the top and the bottom. The 358s don't have that issue. Um, the disadvantage is that they're a little bit slower, and there are some other, some other deficiencies associated with these rail-to-rail -rail op amps, but our whole control circuit is operating at pretty slow speeds. So that's not a disadvantage here. The, having things not go bonkers when the, when the inputs get all the way up to plus or minus 15 is, is much more important than eking the last little bit of performance out of each op amp. So that's, that's the last little piece of advice. Calm down. Oh <laughs> Super cool. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. Trigger on. Yeah. Oh, you got a little bit of oscillation, but it looks good, basically. Yeah, I'm 